Okay, good morning, everybody. All right. Before we get started, hopefully everybody got my email about the cardio assignment. I'm sorry for anybody I told that it was on the bright space. I kept checking the 2020 uh, A&P page and I could see that someone had completed it and I fooled myself. My apologies. Um, so that deadline is pushed until Wednesday. It should be easy. It's mainly reading pictures. You can do it as many times as you want. I want you to have some familiarity with the heart when we move into the heart and start talking about the different chambers and stuff, but I also want to give you guys some points. So take it seriously, but also don't stress about that. Should not be bad. If you have trouble with it, well, let me know. Okay, so we are going to finish up metabol uh, muscle, skeletal muscle stuff before we move into the heart. Uh, so we're going to be doing skeletal muscle metabolism today. we are going to be talking about how muscle cells are getting the HPC they need in order to contract, in order to move your body. So we did talk about metabolism a long time ago. We're not gonna redo all of this in detail, but we do wanna remember a little bit about how we get energy because we're gonna be talking about like variations and how different cells emphasize different parts of this, okay? So we make ATP through cellular respiration. What we have pictured here is this whole uh, aerobic cellular respiration kind of flow, this whole process where we need oxygen at the end to do oxidative phosphorylation. So we start with glucose, we do glycolysis, produce a little bit of ATP, two-ish. We end up with our three carbon molecule pyruvate, which we turn into acetyl-CoA put into the Krebs cycle, produce a minimal amount of ATP here, mostly producing those uh, reduced electron carriers. And then we're going to the electron transport chain and doing oxidative phosphorylation, which gives us a big bang for our buck in terms of ATP, 30-ish uh, units, molecules of ATP. So that was the process we went through before. We also talked about the fact that Without oxygen, we can do uh, this sort of sidestep over here, right? We can keep doing glycolysis over and over and over again without ever going into the mitochondria by turning that pyruvate into lactate to regenerate our electron carriers that we need to just keep doing glycolysis over and over again, which produces some ATP, not a ton of ATP, but it's useful to be able to do if you're going to have low oxygen reserves for whatever reason. So that is metabolism in a nutshell to the level we kind of want it for today. Okay. So we need ATP for our muscle cells because the ATP was part of that cross bridge cycle as how we're allowing our uh, thin and thick uh, filaments to slide past each other in order to shorten our sarcomeres in order to move our attachment points of our muscles. So that so what we are going to see is that with different types of exercise or different like types of contraction, we're actually going to be getting ATP from kind of different places, different sources. Okay? So that's the sort of variation part that we're going to be focusing in on. So we're going to need ATP to contract the muscle, but exactly how we get that ATP can differ. Okay, so our three sources, um, we've talked just now, I summarized oxidative phosphorylation in the mitochondria. That was this whole big process where we need oxygen, right? So that's the one with the electron transport chain, oxidative phosphorylation, making a lot of ATP. Okay. Our little sidestep thing with lactate, right? So if you think about buildup of lactic acid, which I try not to say, because Dr. Schlater said that's a pet peeve of her. Um, ask her about why, why that is. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so our sidestep process where we can just do glycolysis over and over again, 
because we're turning pyruvate into lactate, lactate instead. That's this anaerobic glycolysis, right? So these two we've talked about before when we talked about metabolism. And we have one more option for getting ATP in our muscle fibers. So our new piece is gonna be phosphorylation of ADP by creatine phosphate. So that's gonna be our new thing that we're gonna start off talking about. So creatine and creatine phosphate, it's kind of like you have a little bit of ATP sort of on tap in your muscle cells uh, that you can get without doing that whole metabolism process. There's not a ton of it, but it's gonna like sort of jumpstart the system as you start to contract muscles. So the way this works is you have this enzyme, creatinine kinase. And what that does is it takes creatinine phosphate and ADP and it can turn it into creatine, not phosphate, and ATP. Okay, so reminder about the ADP, ATP, right? Uh, what that is, is we have our adenosine. I'm absolutely not drawing <laughs> actual chemistry, right? But adenosine with two phosphate groups is that ADP and adenosine triphosphate. is just with three, right? So fundamentally what we've done with this system is we just took the phosphate here from the creatine phosphate, plunked it onto ADP, and that's why we have creatine and ATP, T for three, for tri, now here. All right. So what's happening? is that the way our chemical equations work, right, is we're reaching equilibrium. And when we put more of something in, uh, we encounter something called the law of mass action, which basically says if you have more of something on this side, the reaction proceeds in that direction. But if you have more of something on this side, it proceeds in the opposite direction, because this is a reversible reaction. It can go either way. Okay. So what's happening in your muscle cells is as you start to use any little ATP stuff that's floating around in your cytoplasm, right, you're turning that ATP into ADP. That's how you use ATP. You pull off that phosphate group, break the bond, use that bond for energy, in this case for that cross bridge cycle. All right. So as ADP rises, because you started contracting your muscle, now we have more stuff over here. So the reaction is going to run in this direction, giving us more ATP. So that's what we mean when we say that the law of mass action says that the use of ATP drives the reaction to the right. Because we're using ATP, it's turning into ADP, which means we try to make more. Okay. This is also like the philosophy behind why people take like creatine supplements, right? So I assume what's in there is creatine phosphate, right? So if you have a lot more of this, you can go that direction and more, make more ATP, basically. We're trying to sort of play with this system and get ourselves some more fast energy with those. Scientific debate remains about how effective that is and what exactly it's effective for, but that's the idea. So with this system, with creatine phosphate, then the creatine kinase enzyme, giving us creatine plus ATP. You can get about five times the amount of ATP that you would otherwise have in your cell address. So this is super useful. As we talk about different types of exercise, we're gonna be looking at some graphs over time. Okay, so what we're looking at here, our example happens to be light exercise, but I'm gonna start off by just showing us what's going on with this graph. So what we see on the x-axis here is time in minutes. Okay, so one minute, two minute, three minute, four minute. So we're talking about the time as you're doing this light exercise. And here on the y-axis, we're just saying where our energy is coming from, where our ATP is coming from. So these three different colors of lines 
are showing us our three different ways of getting ATP. So we can see that use of creatine phosphate to make ATP, we can say anaerobic glycolysis. That's where the one, the one where pyruvate turns into lactate and we just keep doing that first little glycolysis step over and over again. And then we can see oxidative phosphorylation. So that's the one with oxygen and the electron transport chain making us lots and lots of ATP. So when we look at this graph, what we see is that when you first start to do a little bit of light exercise, right? Say you're starting kind of a slow jog or something, right? You start your muscle contractions for this first uh, almost a minute. The ATP for those muscle contractions coming from creatine phosphate, right? So that's what we mean by it's on tap, right? Like it's there ready for you to use while your cell starts to kickstart its metabolic processes, starts to gather together the enzymes you need, stuff like that, starts to pull glucose into the cell, things like that. Okay. So while your cell is preparing, you're gonna use creatine phosphate to make ATP. Doesn't go for very long. Glycolysis is our first step in metabolism. So the next thing that takes over is anaerobic glycolysis. So the part where you don't need oxygen. So we're gonna start to do that first part uh, of metabolism where we're taking glucose, turning it into pyruvate, getting ourselves on net our two ATP, then shuffling that over to lactate and just running that first bit. So that's gonna happen for approximately the next minute or so, right? And our ultimate goal when we're doing light exercise is to just get ourselves ready and keep those muscles contract contracting until we can kickstart, warm up our whole aerobic metabolism, our aerobic cellular respiration process. Because what's gonna take over long-term here is oxidative phosphorylation. So we're gonna go through all the steps of metabolism, we're going to go all the way into the mitochondria. We're going to juice up that electron transport chain, and we're going to make ourselves a lot of ATP. Okay. So we have some little pieces to kind of prime the pump at the beginning so that as we're warming up, we can still contract our muscles. But ultimately, oxidative phosphorylation using lots of oxygen is going to take over. Okay. So in light to moderate intensity activity, we're going to the bullet points here, right? Initially, we're using creatine phosphate to make ATP, as well as glycolysis up there at the top of our cellular respiration. But ultimately, while we're doing sort of long-term light to moderate intensity activity, right? Say, I don't know, you're doing an hour long yoga video or something, right? You're primarily gonna be doing oxidative phosphorylation. You're gonna be getting oxygen to those cells. You're gonna be, um, yeah, you're, you're going to be using that whole aerobic cellular respiration process. You do have some glycogen in cellular or in skeletal muscle. I remember glycogen, right, is where we have a bunch of glucose just like kind of stuck to itself, right? So we have stored glucose units in glycogen so we can pull them apart, right? Have our glucose units there. And we use those up first before we start to take glucose from the blood into our skeletal muscle and use glucose from the blood. Okay. And we can use that glycogen for a while. Uh, it can take up to 30 minutes before you get the right transporters or enough of the right transporters in your cell membrane to effectively pull in that glucose from the blood. Okay. So, for light to moderate intensity activity, because our goal is to do oxidative phosphorylation and to just keep doing that for a long time after we've warmed up, this means we're going to need oxygen. We're going to need to keep those oxygen supplies, supplies steady. We're going to have to keep them adequate in order to continue this oxidative phosphorylation. So you're going to see, you're going to start breathing harder, right? That's what ventilation is. Ventilation is like physically breathing in and out of your lungs. So you're gonna see an increase in breathing, increase in ventilation. You're gonna breathe faster. Your heart rate's gonna go up because in order to get oxygen to your muscle cells, 
that blood first goes to your lungs, goes back to your heart, then it's fully oxygenated and circulates around your body, right? You need that to happen faster and harder if you're using that oxygen more quickly, okay? So your heart rate's going up, heart contraction's going up, and you're also going to dilate the blood vessels to your muscle. So blood is our delivery system for the oxygen, right? Our lungs breathe in the oxygen, but to get to the muscle, it needs to go through the blood. So those blood vessels are going to dilate in order to deliver that oxygen to our muscle tissue. So that's why you see those things happen as you start to exercise. Heavy intensity activity is a little different. Uh, and so what we mean here when we say heavy intensity activity, we mean something that like you exert a lot of force really fast. So like you're not going on a two hour run, you're doing sprints something like that, right? Or lifting, right? You're just trying to do it for a little bit of time and you're trying to put all your energy into it as fast as possible. Okay. So if you're doing that type of activity, our graph looks different, okay? So we still see what's happening over time, okay? If you are exerting all your effort immediately, you still jumpstart things with creatine phosphate, because it still takes some time to get the right enzymes going for metabolism. Okay, so we see creatine phosphate starting out. But then primarily what you're gonna be doing is anaerobic glycolysis. So you're gonna start that process of metabolism, you're gonna do glycolysis, make it to on that ATP, turn it into lactate, and you're mostly gonna just keep doing that. Right? So if you're doing really heavy intensity activity, that's what's going on. There's a little bit of oxidative sporulation happening, but that never really takes over, mainly because you're using oxygen so fast. It's kind of the big picture reason for this. Okay. So it's not going to be easy to do oxidative phosphorylation if you're using all that oxygen really, really quickly. And so this is why uh, a theory of why like heavy intensity activity makes your muscles burn like really quick. Right, is the idea that that lactate creates like lactic acid buildup in your muscles um, and you feel that it kind of fatigues you. Okay. So in words, we would say that this is primarily using anaerobic glycolysis to generate ATP, which takes pyruvate, converts it to lactate in order to get that NAD plus that we need to run glycolysis over and over again. Um, this doesn't generate a lot of ATP, but it's useful because we don't need oxygen, okay. right? So we're gonna talk about different muscle fibers because in addition to having different types of exercise, we actually have different muscle fibers, like different muscle cells that are better at different types of ATP production essentially and better at different speeds of contraction. And those are going to vary depending on the muscle you're looking at and actually also slightly depending on the person you're looking at. So when we think about skeletal muscles and we're trying to classify their fiber types, um, we're going to be thinking about how fast a muscle fiber contracts. And we're also going to be thinking about how it produces ATP. Okay. And it's going to be different in a different muscle because some muscles, right, like, you think about sitting here listening to me talk for an hour, right? You're keeping your back straight. You're looking forward. You're not horizontal, right? You are actually using muscles, right? You're using your core. You're using your back muscle to hold you up, right? You don't really think about it, right? It's just happening all the time. You use those muscles all day long, right? So that's different than a muscle that you're using exclusively to, I don't know, jump really far or something. Okay, so some muscles are going to have to be low levels of active all the time. Some muscles you use only occasionally. Different muscles are going to have different responsibilities and therefore different metabolic demands. They're going to need different amounts of ATP. Uh, they're going to get different amounts of oxygen in those situations. Okay. So we're going to go through these two pieces of how our muscle fibers can vary. First, contraction velocity. We're gonna talk about fast fibers and slow fibers. 
Okay, so some of these are going to contract quickly, some of them are going to contract more slowly. And then we're going to talk about how they're getting ATP in the end, right? We saw that they're both starting with that uh, creatine phosphate, turning it into creatine and ATP. Um, but we're going to think about ultimately, are they going to do more oxidative phosphorylation in order to make ATP? Or are they really going to stick around doing lots and lots of glycolysis? Okay. And then we're going to combine these two things together. And ultimately, you can describe a muscle fiber as like fast glycolytic fiber, right? Use both of these things to classify a fiber. And we'll talk about that as well. All right. So just a reminder, we're not going to re-memorize the cross-bridge cycle, but hopefully it is still familiar. I know we've had a break. Um, what I want to point out for our purposes right now is the ATP part, right? Okay. So we saw in the cross-bridge cycle that ATP binds to those cross bridges, those heads on the myosin, right? So this is our thick fiber, our myosin. ATP binds to it. And up at the top here, ATP got hydrolyzed. So this is where we actually use the ATP cocking the myosin head. We can see that ATP is now broken into ADP and a phosphate ion, right? Putting us into our high energy form, ready to do a cross bridge cycle. So when we talk about fast and slow fibers for muscle fibers, they do this at a different speed, right? So what we're talking about is how fast does this process happen? Okay. okay. So the myosin ATPase activity, that breaking down of ATP, once the ATP binds onto myosin, can happen faster or it can happen slower. And that actually depends on the type of myosin, like that protein itself in the muscle fiber, in that sarcomere, in that muscle cell. And so that distribution mainly depends on genetics and also what muscle you're talking about, right? But that's gonna be set for any given muscle fiber. The type of myosin is not gonna change, but that type of myosin either works more quickly where it works more slowly for that ATP act, ACE activity, that hydrolysis of ATP. So if you have a fast twitch fiber, what we're saying is that it breaks the ATP more quickly, which means that it can do that cross bridge cycle more quickly because it's taking less time to harvest that energy from the ATP. It is also true that fast twitch fibers relax more rapidly. So they use ATP quick, they hit their peak tension quick, and then they relax quick. Slow twitch fibers still contract, but they do it slowly. So they have a type of myosin that takes a little longer to break ATP, which means they take a little longer to hit their peak tension to generate that maximum force. It also takes them a bit longer to relax. So we see some examples here of muscles that vary in whether they're fast twitch fibers or slow twitch fibers primarily. Okay, so here we see time in milliseconds across the x-axis. And here we see the tension they're producing. And it says percent of maximum because we're comparing muscles that are like different in their strength, right? We're looking at a little muscle that moves your eye versus the gastric memius and your soleus and your calf, right? So we're not comparing the total force, we're just comparing like, has it completely contracted or not, okay? So we can see that for your little eye muscles, so an extra ocular muscle, extra outside of ocular the eye, those are the ones that dart your eyes back and forth to help you look at things, right? It's important that if you're following a deer running across the road or something, Right, your eyes need to move kind of fast. Right? As soon as you see a little flicker of motion, you want to be able to turn, look at it, see what it is, whether you need to worry about it. So those muscles have fast twitch fibers primarily. So they work really quickly. Um, they hit their peak tension really quickly. Okay. Now your calf muscles, which is both gastrocnemius and soleus, are different, all right? You can see here the soleus, is really full of slow twitch fibers, all right? So that's 
going to be helping you stay upright when you're standing. Right? It's going to help you walk all day. Same deal for gastric medius, but that's a little bit more of a fast reaction here. So we can see that they take longer to hit their peak tension versus the extraocular muscle. Okay. So that has to do with the proportion of fast twitch versus slow twitch fibers in these muscles. Okay. So at either ends, we have the extraocular muscle super fast, soleus pretty slow. Gastric mumius probably has a mix of faster twitch fibers and slower twitch fibers. So now we're going to talk about the ATP production part. So we have fast twitch fibers, we have slow twitch fibers, and now we're thinking about whether our fibers primarily use glycolysis or primarily do oxidative phosphorylation. So if we say a fiber is a glycolytic fiber, we mean it's going to do a lot of glycolysis. Right? It's really just named for what it is doing. Okay. So it's primarily going to do glycolysis. If we think about glycolysis, I'll try to draw more of a muscle cell. Okay. So trying to muscle cell, muscle fiber. Right. So think about this as a cell now. I know we usually draw our cells a little squiggly and round, but since we're being specific, we're going to draw these specifically. Um, so for our whole process, when we're trying to figure out whether we have a glycolytic fiber or an oxidative fiber, all right, we're going to think about glycolysis is happening just in the cytoplasm here. Uh, let me also just draw like a nucleus, right? So let's say we have a nucleus with some DNA. This is not great DNA, right? But we got a nucleus, we got a DNA. We got various organelles. When we're thinking about HPP production, the important organelle is the mitochondria. So we got our little sort of kidney beans with their foldy inner membrane and the matrix inside. And I'm drawing this because glycolysis happens in the cytoplasm, all right? So glycolysis is here, glycolysis. And I'm pointing this out because the rest of the steps are funneling all our stuff into our mitochondria. Right, so oxidative phosphorylation is happening across this membrane. Right, we're building up a bunch of hydrogen ions or protons, which we then release in order to power oxidative phosphorylation. So I'm just going to write an arrow. Right, this is where our oxidative phosphorylation would happen. I'm always optimistic about how much room I have. Okay. So the reason I was drawing that out for us is when we're talking about our glycolytic fibers, they're going to be doing glycolysis. It's anaerobic. It doesn't require oxygen. But the other thing we want to make sure we remember about it is that this is happening in the cytoplasm, not in the mitochondria. So glycolytic fibers are not going to have very many mitochondria. They don't need them. They're not doing oxidative phosphorylation, really. They're just doing glycolysis over and over again out in the cytoplasm. So you're not going to see very mitochondria in a muscle fiber that is a glycolytic fiber. Okay. On the flip side, you're going to see lots of enzymes for glycolysis. We didn't go for practically any of the enzymes that we use in metabolism, but hopefully you remember from previous courses that there are a lot of enzymes. If you don't remember that, there are lots of enzymes involved in metabolism. Okay. So a glycolytic fiber is going to have lots of enzymes that help you do glycolysis. Also going to have a lot of glycogen stored in it, right? Because we're going to want lots of glucose pretty quick. Other thing that's going to be true about a glycolytic fiber is it's going to be larger in diameter. And this also makes more sense when we contrast it to our oxidative fibers. But the basic explanation is if we think about oxygen, right? So we have O2 out in the bloodstream. Okay? If you have a little skinny fiber, that is great 
for transporting oxygen in, right? Oxygen can dissolve in, but if you have a little skinny fiber, actually, I'm gonna draw a little skinny fiber. Said. Okay, so a little skinny one. This would be small diameter, right? Super convenient if you want lots of oxygen, because it doesn't have to dissolve very far, right? To get into the mitochondria, to get into the center, right? Very easy to get oxygen spread throughout the cell if you have a little small diameter skinny fiber. If you have a bigger, fatter fiber, that's going to be stronger. You're going to produce more force because you can fit more sarcomeres in parallel, right? But the problem is that as you try to get oxygen, it still has to just dissolve in. So it's going to be harder to spread that oxygen out into the center of a cell if you have a larger diameter fiber. So what we're saying here about the glycolytic fibers, that they're doing glycolysis, which doesn't require oxygen, which means that they don't have really any of the features that are designed for getting you oxygen. So they don't have the mitochondria because they don't need mitochondria because they're not doing oxidative phosphorylation. And they can be larger in diameter because they don't really care that it's going to make it harder to get oxygen into that cell because they're not using oxygen to produce their energy in the first place. Right? So this means we can have stronger fibers like with harder contractions because we can stack lots of sarcomeres in parallel, but we're not going to be able to do this long-term oxidative phosphorylation production of energy. They're also therefore going to be quicker to fatigue, right? They're going to contract up pretty quickly usually. Um, but they're gonna use all their energy. They're trying to produce more with glycolysis. Glycolysis isn't a super effective way to produce energy. So they're gonna be quick to fatigue. So. I do have to clear. All right. So the oxidative fibers are pretty much just gonna be the reverse of everything, okay? So oxidative fibers, instead of doing glycolysis, they're going all the way through our aerobic cellular respiration process. So we're taking that glucose, we're turning it into pyruvate, we're shoveling that into our mitochondria, we're going through the Krebs cycle, we're using the electron transport chain to do oxidative phosphorylation and produce a lot of ATP. Okay? So they're primarily going to be using oxidative phosphorylation, which is why we call them oxidative fibers. Okay? So if you remember that, you can work backwards to understand a lot of their features. Because they're doing oxidative phosphorylation, they're gonna need mitochondria because that is where oxidative phosphorylation happens, okay? Because they are doing oxidative phosphorylation, a lot of their traits are gonna to relate to their need for oxygen. So one thing that we haven't talked about yet, something called myoglobin, Really what we wanna know about myoglobin is that it's in oxidative fibers, but it's pretty cool. Uh, so myoglobin is a molecule that allows you to store oxygen for later, essentially. So at rest, you're still getting oxygen to your cell, right? your blood's still pumping, you're still breathing. Oxidative fibers can store that oxygen when you're at rest in myoglobin. So they have a little extra boost of oxygen when they're eventually trying to do all this oxidative phosphorylation. Fun fact, since we just had Thanksgiving, this is why there's a difference between like dark meat and white meat in your turkey, right? That dark part is actually the myoglobin um, because myoglobin has a color, it's red, right? So it's this darker color because it's storing that oxi uh, oxygen in it. So because they need oxygen, they're also going to have a lot of blood flow, right? Blood delivers oxygen. So oxidative fibers are going to have lots of capillaries, which are like the end points of our cardiovascular system where we see a bunch of exchange of gases between tissue and the blood. So lots of capillaries, lots of blood flow to our oxidative fibers because they need that oxygen coming from the blood. These are the fibers that are going to be small and skinny right? Because they need that oxygen to dissolve out of the blood and into the muscle fibers. So we may or may not remember about our plasma membranes, but oxygen, right? 
Oxygen is nonpolar, it's really small. So we don't have transporters for oxygen. We can't pull it in with active transport. We're really just waiting for it to dissolve across that plasma membrane. Fine. So it's happening through that passive transport, that simple diffusion. Right. So they're going to be small in diameter to make that easier to give themselves lots of surface area in contact with the blood. Okay. Finally, they're going to be more resistant to fatigue. They're making lots of energy through this oxidative phosphorylation process, this process that uses oxygen. It takes us a while to get this process going, but once it's going, we can do it for a long time and we get a lot more energy for that cell than we would for a glycolytic fiber. Questions about this fast versus slow twitch or this glycolytic first oxidative before we start to combine the two. So, just my tip for remembering these features, right? Spend some time thinking about how this relates to their need for oxygen, because then you can just think, okay, oxidative oxygen, if you understand how all of these things are related to a need for oxygen, right? You don't have to memorize a bunch of bullet points. Okay. So if you can internalize that, just the name should tell you a lot of these features. Okay. So when we look at actual skeletal muscle fibers, we're gonna see three types of them. So now we're combining, right? So we're gonna have slow oxidative fibers. So they're slow titch, fibers, they have that slow myosin, and they're doing oxidative phosphorylation. Instead of doing the second one, I'm going to jump to the end. We're going to have fast twitch fibers that do glycolysis, right? So slow and oxidative, fast and glycolytic, right? So slow, slow twitch versus fast twitch, oxidative phosphorylation versus glycolysis. And then we're going to have an intermediate type of fiber called a fast oxidative fiber. So this is intermediate. Okay. So that's why I circled the slow oxidative and the fast glycolytic. You're gonna think of them as opposites. And then you're gonna tack on the fast oxidative in the middle there, okay? So we're gonna start kind of in that order. Okay. So a slow oxidative fiber, is gonna be doing oxidative phosphorylation, it's going to need lots of oxygen and it's contracting relatively slowly. Okay. So if we wanted to name all its features, we would say that it has low myosin ATPase activity, by which we mean we're talking about that step of the oxygen cycle where we break the ATP. That is a property of the type of myosin in the fiber. Our slow oxidative fibers are doing that slowly, so it takes them longer to contract, longer to relax. Okay. They have high oxidative capacity, and they are doing aerobic respiration. So using lots of oxygen, doing lots of oxidative phosphorylation, which means, like we just went through with our oxidative fibers versus our glycolytic ones, we're going to see lots of mitochondria. We're going to see lots of blood flow, so lots of capillaries, and we're going to see myoglobin, that storage molecule for extra oxygen. They're going to be small in diameter, which we know is helpful related to that oxygen piece. This means there's a small diffusion barrier. Right? So that's saying that it's easy for oxygen to diffuse from that rich blood flow all the way through our cell because the fiber is skinnier. But a consequence of having a small diameter fiber happens to be that they can't produce all that much tension, right? So they're gonna produce less force because they have to be skinny to get that oxygen. So our small diameter fibers have a small diffusion barrier, so they're good at getting oxygen, but they're bad at producing tons of force because they can't stack that many sarcomeres in parallel. They do fatigue slowly, right? So they fatigue slowly because they are doing this oxidative phosphorylation. They're producing lots of ATP. They're not even really contracting quite as hard because they're smaller in diameter. And it takes them longer to relax because of this uh, slow myosin. Right? 
right? So all of that kind of leads into a slower process for fatigue. Okay. So now we're jumping to the opposite type of fiber. So slow and oxidative is gonna be the opposite of fast and glycolytic. Okay. So they have the opposite type of myosin. They have that fast myosin that can break ATP really quickly, do that cross bridge cycle really quickly, uh, and then relax really quickly. Okay. They're gonna be doing lots of glycolysis. So they're gonna have lots of enzymes for glycolysis. And they're actually gonna be having pretty high storage of glycogen. Um, so a way we could explain that to ourselves, right, is because they're contracting so quickly and they're also gonna fatigue rapidly and they're gonna relax quickly, right? They need a more immediate form of glucose than waiting for the blood to bring it to them. So it's more helpful to have glycogen already in that cell ready to go so they can do this more quickly. They're not gonna have my myoglobin. They're not storing oxygen. They're not doing oxidative phosphorylation. Uh, so you, if you look at this muscle, it's gonna be lighter in color. So if you look at your turkey, you're gonna like white meat, you like turkey breast, you are eating fast glycolytic fibers, um, no myoglobin in them. They can be large in diameter because they don't need that much oxygen. That means they can be really strong. They can produce lots of tension, lots of sarcomeres and parallel. The flip side is that because they don't have oxygen, they're not doing oxidative phosphorylation, they're not using that most effective way of producing ATP, they're gonna get tired quicker, they fatigue rapidly. In my opinion, the trickiest place is to remember that this intermediate fiber exists and its properties. Okay, so I'm going to just flip back real quick, right? So we had slow and oxidative. We had fast and glycolytic. And just looking at these words, slow and oxidative both have O's in there. So that's helpful. Okay, slow and oxidative, fast and glycolytic. Now we're gonna have fast and oxidative. So we're mixing together two properties, right? So we're gonna have fast twitch fibers that are doing oxidative phosphorylation. Okay. So they are fast because of the type of myosin they have. Um, so they're gonna have a myosin that's kind of intermediate in how fast it breaks apart that ATP, okay? So it's faster than the slow twitch fibers, which is why we're gonna just call it fast, okay? So the myosin ATPase activity is breaking apart the ATP pretty quickly. So we have cross bridges forming pretty quickly. We're contracting pretty quickly. However, instead of just doing a bunch of glycolysis, we're going to be trying to get to that oxidative phosphorylation. All right, we're going to be trying to use that sort of more long-term process for energy production. So these oxidative fibers, right, they're oxidative, right? So they are going to have myoglobin. They are going to be using oxygen. They are going to be uh, slower to fatigue, right? Okay, they're going to be trying to use that more productive uh, form of ATP production. So those two pieces are gonna be kind of fixed properties. The myosin ATPase activity is not really something that you can change. Myoglobin, not really something you can change all that much either, right? So that's why they're fast and that's why they're oxidative. We are gonna see that with training, we can kind of do some conversion here. Well, we'll talk about that in a second. But fast oxidative fibers are gonna be kind of intermediate between our two opposites, the slow oxidative and the fast glycolytic. Okay. So here we see this all in table form for people who like tables, really easy way to set up um, probably quizlets for yourself or flashcards or something, right? So we're comparing slow oxidative, fast oxidative and fast glycolytic fibers. All right. So in terms of response to exercise, every named muscle you have is going to have some mix of these different fiber types. Right? It's going to have some slow oxidative fibers. It's going to have some fast glycolytic fibers. And it's going to have some fast oxidative fibers. Um, the proportions are going to change 
depending on what muscle it does, it is depending on what it habitually does. Um, so as I was saying, the muscles like in your back that hold you up sitting here or standing forever in line or something, right? Those postural muscles that have to work all day don't need to contract very quickly. Hopefully you don't need to snap to attention unless you're starting to fall asleep a little bit, right? So they can contract slowly, but they need to work all day. So we need to keep getting them oxygen so that they can keep contracting. So something that helps you maintain your posture is gonna have lots of slow oxidative fibers versus a muscle that you only use occasionally. Really strong one you use for sprinting would have more fast glycolytic fibers. Okay. However, named muscle has a mixture of fiber types, but a motor unit doesn't. Okay. So remember that a motor unit is just a group of fibers that are all responding to the same neuron, right? So they're all responding to the same nerve, okay? So any given motor unit is just gonna have one fiber type, okay? Now, our motor units get recruited in order. Remember, we start with our little small fiddly motor units, and then we tack on bigger and bigger ones to get more and more force, okay? So that is going to match up to the recruitment order for these fiber types as well, because each motor unit has a specific fiber type. So those small, weak, thin diameter muscles, right, are thin in diameter. That means they don't have much force. So we thought about them as little finger muscles. But now we know that having a small diameter is a property of our oxidative fibers. And specifically, our slow oxidative fibers are going to be those smaller motor units. Then we're going to do our intermediate size motor units are going to have fast oxidative fibers, so that intermediate type of fiber. And then our big, strong muscles, our big, strong motor units are going to have the fast glycolytic fibers that don't need oxygen, so they can be really thick in diameter, really big, really strong. All right, uh, we'll quit here for today and continue on with this on Wednesday. Just got a little, I'll see pictures, but we got a bit to go.